when bureaucracies try to solve problems, they tend to do it in a way that looks like this. This is the New York City Department of Education procurement process. If they want to acquire any new curriculum, any new technology, it goes through something that looks like this, um, which can take anywhere from six months to about three years. Mayor Bloomberg, with the, uh, the school's chancellor, Joel Klein, created an Office of Innovation, which was also known as the iZone. And it was to function as a, both a, a laboratory and also as a provocation to the system itself to get it to think differently about how it defined its problems and, and sourced its solutions. In the iZone, we decided to run a series of experiments, of demonstrations, to show how it could be different. We decided to go directly to the users, the people who had the problems, teachers, students, principals, families, um, get them to identify the problems that were important to them, and then expose those problems to a broad community of problem solvers and then let those people who had the problems to begin with judge which of those solutions might be useful and then work with the problem solvers to improve them and to iterate them and to implement them. First, rather than assuming that we knew what the problem was, we spent a month with anthropologists and a design firm in middle school math classrooms talking to and watching teachers and students and curriculum coaches and principals deal with the math problems and sort of articulate why was it so hard to teach and learn math. Um, in the U.S., middle school is where math skills just kind of fall off a cliff and where students lose interest in math. Before before that, almost everybody's interested in it. After that, very few people are interested in it. We invited the software developers, this was all software, into the classrooms for nine months to work with the teachers to iterate and improve the products so that they suited an urban classroom better than they would have without that collaboration. This model of using classrooms for test beds where the teachers were benefiting as much from that relationship as the developers were, that caught on very quickly. And now in the U.S. we have hundreds or, or maybe thousands of classrooms acting as these test beds with small ed tech companies fa uh, funded. These relationships are funded by uh, some of the major educational foundations. Let the people who have the problem define the problem. Let them speak to it. Because what a teacher in a classroom or a driver on a bus says the problem is, is almost certainly not what somebody sitting in the central headquarters who doesn't deal with this every day is going to say the problem is. So if you actually want to be useful, talk to the people that you want to be useful for. Don't tell your problem solvers what the solution should look like. Like, they're not robots. Um, so let them use their creativity. Right? Let them use their experience. Let them use the way that their perspective is different from yours to add value. Because you're almost certainly going to be wrong about what the best answer is because you're a human being. And so you want to like, leave room for other people's good ideas. Don't think that you're creating things for people. You're creating things with people, right? This is a collaborative process. The more you bring people in, A, I believe, the better the product is going to be. But this is also a social and a political process, right? If you want people to accept your involvement and accept this thing that you're doing with them, have them be in the loop. It just makes it much more likely that they're going to bear with you and forgive you when it's imperfect and you know, maybe overcome their skepticism and give it a shot if they were involved. You have to create a climate where making mistakes is kind of OK. And that was really what the job of the iZone was for. It was to try new things, and they didn't always work. And when they didn't work, we were like, OK, sorry, we tried that. It didn't work. Let's try something else. Um, and that's an attitude that people end up respecting. Um, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a way of building trust. If you don't have the, the time, if you don't have the leadership that allows that process to take hold, then the change can be not very durable. Um, and then when you get a new leader or you get a new policy, then things go back to the way they were because these new habits don't have time to take hold. And schools aren't really set up for experimentation and validation for a whole bunch of reasons. So partly, again, it's about getting political permission 
The system has to want this to happen, and it has to reward people for trying it, even when those experiments don't work out. If you say, yeah, go ahead and try something new, and then the instant it doesn't work, you know, you get slapped. Like, that's the end of it. What convinces people to do new things is they like it more. Um, and so I'm actually a big believer in um, if, if, if teachers enjoy being in school more, if kids enjoy being in the classrooms more, if parents express satisfaction. To me, that's about as good an evidence as I'm likely to get that these changes were worthwhile. In the startup world, um, the way that's been found very effective to mitigate risk is to spread your risk by trying a lot of small experiments, knowing that a lot of them are not going to be successful, but the ones that are, are going to be worth really kind of reinvesting in. And so you can make the choice to say that schools are not a laboratory and that schools are not an investment portfolio and we're going to tolerate zero risk. We could make that choice as a society, but then we'll get exactly what we have right now. And it's not as if that what we have right now has no downside or no risk, because if it were, we would all be delighted with the way our schools are. And, you know, a lot of people are not delighted.